I think we as a society have to like think about what what um, in environments are we placing teenagers in, um, and what are we holding them accountable to, and how unreasonable or reasonable are we being? Um, there have been actually uh, we do know that they take risks more. You can quantify it on on psychological testing and animals studies will show that too. They're going to be taking more risks and they're, they're not quite there with respect to their judgment. Um, so actually there were uh, there was a Supreme Court um, uh, debate about this several years ago. It was written up in Science Magazine um, as to whether you know teenage the teenager, the adolescent was akin to you know, uh, mental disability um, because they were just not there yet in terms of their ability to judge. I think that, you know, you could obviously see this information stretching into, into the wrong um, direction. It's not going to be an excuse for bad behavior. I think, w again, by talking to the teenagers about what it is and where they're at, I think we are, from externally, giving them the, the information that they might make better choices and know when to objectively say to themselves, oh, maybe I'm not equipped to handle this situation yet. So this is the whole point of these, these lectures that we give to the teenagers themselves, not to the parents exclusively, not to the, their teachers exclusively. They, we talk to them and we give them the same talk, but Few people have, a few groups have gone out to actually talk to teenagers themselves. This is the first generation of adolescents that have had access to this kind of information because it didn't exist. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're quoting is stuff from 2006 and 2007 and, you know, in the, since 2000. So a lot of it's very new. So previous generations just didn't have this accessible. And it will take some years until it gets into textbooks and, you know, you know, health and growth courses, et cetera, which is probably where we hope that this, this information will land. So the idea is that if we give them a sense that um, they actually might be more vulnerable to certain things, so they might want to make different choices when it comes to, you know, um, substance use or uh, putting themselves at risk, uh, and also to tell them that they have actually probably better learning capacity now than ever again in, for certain types of learning. And to embrace that and, and really try to use this time um, in their lives to respect the fact that they have this strength. And so it's, a, it's a, all good messages, um, but for rather than them necessarily, they might not use this time as wisely and it's a very special time. So we want to let them know that, that they're in this very golden period of development. We've been very pleased with how um, they've responded. They've asked us a lot of great questions. They've been very interactive um, they're, because they're very interested in themselves. And it's a time when you should be interested in yourself. You're trying to figure yourself out. So we've had lots of questions, you know, like how much sleep do I need? What is sleep deprivation doing to my brain? Can I get away with this? Or how much do I really need? And they really want answers. And, and I think, it's a, as I said, it's, it's a fact-based generation. This is like the information age. They are like brokering information all day long. This is like, this is what they, this is a big issue for them. And, and so you give them this information about themselves and some of it is enlightening to them. I mean, we had a lot of like, oh, so that's why I do that. You know, oh, that's da da da, you know. And that's been um, a lot of that kind of response. I've had other, um, you know, responses from girls saying, well, should we be, you know, in different classrooms from boys and boys asking, well, you know, um, why are boys more aggressive than girls? And you know, why can't we sit down, as, you know, and stay and sit and read these books as easily as our, you know, the girl classmates can? Um, I've, we've had some, you know, sensitive questions about drug abuse, um, and it's a safe place to ask these questions because it can be, um, it doesn't have to be so personal. It can be hypothetical, but we have the we have the facts for them. So the parents, um, again, were, uh, many of them came back to us with, oh, this is amazing. You've explained why, you know, my kid is this way, and now I'm going to be a little bit more uh, patient with that kid. I realize that the kid is not, you know, this hateful person who's constantly, you know, trying to reject me or being, you know, forgetful or that it's really not necessarily their fault that they are this way and to, you know, sort of embrace their energy but understand that some of these things they do aren't really their fault. You know, they, they really are not 
we are, we tend to as parents um, because they appear adult like in size <laughs> think that they should be responsible for themselves and be showing up at the appointments on time and this, that, and the other, and they make mistakes, and they're not there yet. So I think it, it has, the, the parents are like, oh, this, I will, I can just back off a little bit, and that's been really um, nice to see. This is an area, as I said, has been, it's not been neglected, but it's sort of just been overlooked. I mean, there was way more excitement, you know, looking at the infant brain and, and then at the senescent and older adult, you know, the, the degenerating aspects of, you know, later life. That's, a lot of money has gone into those two extremes because they've been very pressing and big healthcare burdens, et cetera. But, you know, now that we've sort of gone beyond that and the, the lots of active research in both those ends, we can begin to recognize that, that there are multiple stages of life for the brain and each of those stages are actually physiologically different from one another and that the teen, teen, teen brain, the post, the adolescent, peri-adolescent brain is its own little section of development and, and has some, you know, very unique signatures to it. And I think that it's a place where a lot of human, you know, psychological research as well as basic research will now start to come together. Um, we kind of needed the two ends of life to sort of pit anchor us so that we could then like move in and understand that there's a huge difference from early life to late life so now and from early life to adult. So what's going on for the toddlers? What's going on for the school age kids? What's going on for the you know tween generation? What's going on for the mid teens? You know, and what's going on for the early adults? So the early adults, you know, brain development does not finish until sometimes 23, 24, 25. Um, so there's there's a whole story there that's probably yet to be mined. So I think it's going to be an area that um, will have impact on our education, our social policies you know, health policies. We already know, for instance, that, you know, drugs that are used for treatment um, for, for adults, for psychiatric conditions, for instance, for depression, we already know, we saw that in the news two years ago with, you know, the effects of some of these antidepressants on the teen brain were unexpected. It was not really even on anybody's radar screen that these, you know, people who are weighing the same amount as their adult counterparts would have any different need of medication compared to the adults. We could understand that a small child would have a small, need a smaller dose, they weigh less, et cetera, but teenagers were kind of just lumped in with adults, and I think that's a really good example of why it's going to have impact on, on medical therapy, I think, too.